Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Without that case, there will be literally nothing around us. Not even a shelter over our heads. And most probably we are going to have this session outside in the nature. Not a bad thing, I must confess, but I don't think it would be comfortable being in that hut as we are here in this historic building, which was, by the way, built by aggregates as well. So aggregates are everywhere around us. They just built everything. We come in contact with them at every single second of our life. It's our houses, roads, ports, airports, hospitals, schools, offices, everything around us. And aggregates are also needed in order to rebuild this. And this. Unfortunately, are needed to rebuild this. And here I say unfortunately because this, of course, could be avoided. So, do you know that in order to build an average house, we need around uh, 400 tons? For an average school, we need around 3,000 tons. For uh, every kilometer of motorway, we need around 30,000 tons. And for every kilometer of railway, we need around 9,000 tons. So, all this infrastructure in Europe, and the rebuilding of, uh, of various disasters, we need 3 billion tons per year. This is a huge amount, it is a huge volume, and this volume makes the uh, aggregate industry being by far the largest extractive industry, not only in Europe, globally. And also this huge amount makes aggregates being the second most consumed material on planet Earth after water. Humanity consumes in volumes first water and then aggregates. We are talking about huge volumes. And in order to, to imagine this huge volume of 3 billion tons, just imagine a stockpile 8 meters wide, 8 meters high, around the equator every year. This is a volume of, eight B, uh, of 3 billion tons. 8 meters by 8 meters around the equator every year. And if we go globally now, the, the consumption globally is 14 billion tons. As I said, Europe is 3 billion, United States is 2.5 billion, China is 18 billion, 40% of the global consumption is China, and India is nearly 7 billion. And if we go globally now, this stockpile is going to be 27 by 27 meters around the equator every year. So just think of the whole surface area of Europe. Do you know that all the quarries in Europe, which are more than 26,000, the total surface area of all the quarries in Europe take only 0.05% of the total surface area of Europe. This is the analogy. The green background is all Europe, and the yellow dot are the to is the total surface area of these 26,500 quarries. So this huge industry, which provides these Huge volumes, this essential product, occupy, operate in a so small area around Europe. So, Aggregates UPG. What is Aggregates UPG? It's the European Aggregates Association. Just like we have national associations, which are used in order to lobby uh, policy makers, in order to lobby stakeholders, we need also a European association, since everything is coming from Brussels. So, we need this association in order to lobby in Brussels for the best benefit of our industry, but in the, long t in the long run for the best benefit of humanity. Why? Because we provide an essential raw material. So, what we are doing as a European Aggregates Association, we lobby European institutions and stakeholders, we promote interests of our members, we seek and maintain close collaboration uh, with uh, NGOs, big international NGOs, we will speak later about them, and we promote the essentiality of aggregates for our economic growth and comfortable life. How we do it? By uh, having extended membership around Europe, and you will see later our members. We have a sound and stable finance framework because of so many members we have, and these allow us to maintain a very strong base team in Brussels, which work for the association. Why we do all this? in order to act as the advocate and the voice of the European aggregates industry so that we will have a sustainable and responsible extractive industry for the long-term benefit of humankind. So, UEPG 
exists since 1987. We have members in 25 countries. We have our offices in Brussels, very near to the European Parliament. We have our base team uh, there. Here I want to stop. Turkey, yes, is our member. And I need to say this, I need to comment this, that when I was first elected president back in 2021, June 2021, the first email, co congratulations email, came from our Turkish colleagues. And I am from Cyprus, as you very well know. So this is our structure. We have the delegates assembly, the members. Then we have the UPG board, which I'm honored to chair for a second term. And then we have the General Secretariat, is our uh, Brussels-based team, and we have several committees, task forces, working groups, working specifically, specifically on several uh, issues we are dealing with. Uh, 26,500 quarries. We have the luxury to have from all these members sitting on these committees the best of the best. One example is our colleague Water here, who is an expert in recycling, and he will talk later. So let's see some numbers, 3 billion tons, 26,500 cores around Europe. Each European citizen consumes, needs, better say, 6 tons per year. And uh, this industry in Europe employs around 185,000 people. This is a trend for the last, uh, since 2006, it used to be 3.7, then the recession took it down to 2.6. Now we are back about 3 billion. 2023 is a little bit down. Mainly the North countries are facing a little bit recession. Now, as you can see on this graph, we have from Germany who has almost 600 million tons down to Malta 1.6 million tons. So it's all the European countries plus UK plus EFTA, these numbers. If we go back to consumption per capita, as I said, 5.6 actually is the number. Uh, consumption per capita in the EU 27 plus UK plus EFTA. If we see more countries we have on this graph, this goes to 5.2. Okay, some countries, for example, Norway. Norway has a lot of exports. That's why you see Norway so high. But Cyprus, we will see later regarding Cyprus the numbers which, as you can see here, is around 11 tons per capita, double of the average of Europe. Here is a breakdown of the aggregates produced in Europe. We have sun and gravel, 38%, crash rock, 43%, recycle, 10%, and I will elaborate later on the recycle aggregates, manufacture 1.8, 2.3 marine aggregates. Here is a graph for the recycling around Europe. As I said, the average is 10% on Europe, so out of the 3 billion tons, 300 million come from the recycling. As you can see here, some countries manage better. Here, Belgium, number one, what do you will explain why. Mm -hmm. Netherlands, UK, number two, Germany, number three, Spain, number four, Italy, number five, and these countries declare that they managed to recycle all their waste. So the ceiling of recycling substitution, we can say, can go up to 20, 25%. This is the ceiling. For this, there are three main reasons. First of all, we build much more than what we demolish. Secondly, if we demolish a building and if we use it, most modern techniques, we are not going to get back 100% of the aggregates used. And in the future, we, we, we believe that the demolition waste will, will be less and less because now we demolish buildings built before 50, 60 years, but what we build today will last more than 100 years. So the waste will be less and less and water you can elaborate later on. So we have in Cyprus 11 million tons. 2024, we, we anticipate it to be 11 million tons. Last year it was 10. 24 cores in Cyprus, 11 tons per capita. is double than the average consumption of Europe. And our industry in Cyprus employs around 500 people. This is a graph back in 1993. You can see the upturn until 2008, which was the top. Then the big recession, we went minus 80%. The bottom was 2015. And now, as you can see here, we are catching up. 2023 was 10 million. This year is anticipated to go to 11 million. These are some uh, co comparisons, let's say. We are 155% <coughs> up from the bottom 2015 in Cyprus, but we are still minus 29% from the peak, which was 2008. So as European aggregates industry, we started as being primary aggregate producers. 
Now, secondary, we are also secondary aggregate producer now. Recycling is already part of our business model. <coughs> we host habitats of endangered protected plant and animal species. Clara, you can elaborate on this later. And more and more renewable energy is produced within the forest. There are many cases around Europe and inside of the world. We have many publications for anything we are dealing with. You can visit our site to download. Many, many interesting publications. One of our important latest publications is our roadmap to 2030, where we say what we need, what we promise, and what we will deliver in order to be sustainable and responsible. Of course, we need a few things also from the policymakers. Another important publication is our roadmap to, to, to neutral aggregates, as we say. The footprint, the, the CO2 footprint of aggregates is only 4.5 tons. 4.5 kilograms per ton of aggregates produced, and very easily we can go to zero. And in this uh, publication, we, we explain how we can go zero. It's very easy. If we have green electricity and electrified machinery, these big caterpillars, as you know, if we have electrified machinery in the near future and coming, very easily we will go to zero. So it is uh, biodiversity. And we have experts here, Clara will uh, elaborate later on this. We have hundreds, not to say thousands, cases around Europe, scientifically proven that biodiversity increases both in the active of forest, but of course as well in the restored forest. And we have very close collaboration with international NGOs, these big names, I'm sure you know them, Fertilizing Europe, mm -hmm. WWF, United Nations Environmental Program. Actually, our Secretary General, Dan Finske, was going to be with us today, but yesterday there was a meeting in UNED in Geneva. He had to participate there, so he couldn't be here. And we have very close collaboration also with the That's all. Thank you very much. I hope I get my second. Almost. We'll be about 10 minutes, but thank you very much, uh, President Laduros, for the insight and valuable information that will help us uh, understand further the panel discussion. Madam Commissioner, I will start this uh, panel discussion with you. Based on Mr. Laduro's presentation, which shows that aggregates are essential for humanity, what regulatory measures can the government implement to ensure a sustainable supply of aggregates while pro whilst protecting the environment? Mm. Thank you for the floor. Before answering uh, the question, which uh, I happily received in advance to prepare myself, I, I would like to note the absence of two key uh, authorities responsible for shaping uh, the mineral resource policy uh, from our panel today, the Geological Survey Department and the Mines and Coal Service. I think that the participation would have been most fruitful. Uh, Mr. Latour's presentation was interesting and while I may have certain observations or specific aspects, I believe it is important not only to explore good practices from abroad, such as the installation of photovoltaic uh, systems in terraces and quarries, but also to provide an overview of the current state of both active and inactive quarries in Cyprus to enable us to judge the sustainability aspect. I would also encourage Mr. Laturos to share examples of restoration efforts as well, which would further enrich our dialogue on sustainable practices in this field. Coming now to the answering, to answering your question. Stating in advance that natural ecosystems have set the ceiling and our building development industry should adapt to that ceiling. To ensure a sustainable supply of aggregates, while safeguarding our environment, urgent coordinate action is required in line with the principles outlined in the Critical Raw Materials Act. This act emphasizes reducing dependency on unsustainable practices and fostering the circular use of materials. It is essential to fundamentally redesign the unsustainable systems of production and consumption that dominate the industry today. If we fail to act, we risk facing irreversible environmental consequences. And I'm speaking also as an architect. As Professor Hans Brunig 
uh, a UN international resource uh, panelist emphasized the choice is clear. We either change by disaster or by design. And the natural ecosystems have set the ceiling. One key regulatory measure is integrated legislation that strengthens and aligns mining laws, land use planning, and environmental regulations across the entire life cycle of aggregates, from extraction to processing, taking into consideration resource depletion, environmental harm, and pressures, uh, pressures related to energy and emissions. A life cycle approach will provide a better understanding and effective responses to environmental impacts. Moreover, the government may enforce mandatory nature-based solutions within the framework of environmental impact assessments for every coin project, ensuring that environmental and biodiversity concerns are fundamental to the planning processes. Quarry operators need to be legally required to, to implement rehabilitation plans that prioritize nature-based be solutions, such as creating wetlands or rewilding initiatives to restore ecosystems and improve resilience after extraction activities. Furthermore, we need to impose a circular econ economy model where the reuse of construction and demolition waste, uh, as you mentioned before, C and D, W becomes the norm, addressing both the excessive consumption of raw materials and the non-reuse of aggregates, critical issues in current practices. Regular monitoring and enforcement of regulations, including frequent inspections, is necessary to ensure compliance and mitigate social and environmental impacts like landscape degradation, water and air pollution, and biodiversity threats. Concluding, in line with the new European Bauhaus, I hope is familiar to all of you, we should prioritize the reuse of existing buildings over new construction, thereby minimizing the extraction of new materials and reducing construction waste. As we strive to make the aggregates industry more sustainable, prioritizing the adaptive reuse of existing structures should be an integral part of our national strategy. Environmental impact thresholds should also be introduced, regulating extraction activities by setting strict limits on habitat destruction and biodiversity loss. Any activity that exceeds these thresholds must be halted to relocate to less sensitive areas. This includes also extension of quarries. In addition, the use to alternative building materials, such as earth materials and atope bricks, should be promoted as part of regulatory frameworks. These traditional low-impact materials offer sustainable alternatives to conventional ag aggregates, reducing environmental degradation while preserving local cultural heritage. Government incentives for companies investing in eco-friendly technologies and sustainable coring practices, along with promoting the above-mentioned materials will help ensure that the aggregates industry aligns with long-term sustainability goals while fostering innovation. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. The next question will be addressed to Dr. Missy Meris. How does your department, the Department of Environment, prioritize sustainability in aggregate uh, extraction and use, and what measures are in place to monitor and mitigate the environmental impact of aggregate uh, operations? So first of all, good morning to everybody. Many thanks to the organizers and many thanks for the invitation. Uh, before going to, to the measures that we have in place, and uh, before, because uh, we, we talk about sustainability, strictly speaking, uh, the aggregate production is not sustainable since uh, aggregates are not uh, renewables. So if we want to talk about sustainability and aggregates, we have to find and talk about the optimum balance between all the processes that we have uh, 
on, on the aggregates and the way that we handle. Doctor, Ms. Ray, sorry to interrupt you because our microphones are directional. I would uh, kindly ask all of the guests when they're speaking to and they're turning their uh, faces to use the microphone at, at the same direction because in the in the room everyone can hear us but on the live streaming it's a kind of difficulty and it goes up and down in volume sorry about that please continue uh, uh, yes i'll uh, just uh, conclude that about sustainability and aggregates uh, uh, we have to uh, find the, the optimum way how to better uh, use all the elements of the processes in a sustainable way since aggregates is not uh, a renewable resource so uh, it's better to focus on how we do with all the procedures you have in place. I will not uh, repeat what uh, our commissioner already mentioned about sustainability and aggregates. I will focus on the tools that we have in place in order to mitigate uh, the, the environmental impacts and find the, the appropriate way how we were, were working on, on the safe side regarding the environmental parameters. Of course, we do have the appropriate policy uh, framework at EU level. We, we uh, are aware about the Green Deal and about the basic pillar, pillar of the Green Deal. We talk about uh, circular economy and the basic elements within this uh, new policy framework, new policy approach. And within this uh, policy framework, we have already adopted a number of legal frameworks, including the, the uh, uh, aggregate uh, extraction, aggregate uh, uh, production, aggregate uh, use, and of course, uh, the way that we handle the, the waste uh, uh, from the the sector. So uh, at the national level, we do have the appropriate uh, legal framework to minimize and uh, control the environmental impacts from all elements of all this uh, aggregate extraction, production, use, and disposal. Uh, in general, we do have uh, the, the environmental impact assessment law. So before issuing the any town planning uh, permit uh, for this kind of activities and environmental impact assessment and uh, have to submit it to by the department and we do have the technical committee to evaluate and assess this environmental impact assessment study and then we issue our opinion to the town planning authority and uh, our opinion is uh, uh, of course uh, having the terms and conditions, how to, how to better approach all uh, elements of the aggregate uh, production uh, in order to protect the environmental impacts. And of course, apart from the environmental impact assessment uh, study and permission, we do have other uh, uh, legislative acts, for example, uh, regarding the air pollution, uh, regarding the, the uh, water um, uh, and uh, the um, uh, waste management issues. And of course, uh, uh, we do have the appropriate uh, structure in order to enforce and implement the, the legal provisions that we have in place. So uh, one uh, element that uh, we are working on it is to introduce a new approach in our uh, department and a new structure that uh, will focus on, uh, on inspection uh, about the, the issues uh, and the permits that uh, we, we have in place for these kind of activities. Thank you very much. If you have any comments, we'll, you will get the floor later on after the panel discussion because I'm sure when it comes to uh, the government, we all have some questions and we want clarifications. Moving on to our Professor Zehonkova, coin has an indisputable impact on the landscape. Can extractive sites uh, still be attractive for nature conservation and what can they offer? Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to join you at this meeting. Generally, 
all extraction activities causes mineral, uh, causes some environmental impact. But we should also see the other side, that these sites have great potential to create remarkable sites uh, of, ge of high geodiversity. And that's especially important in the graded landscape or homogeneous landscape. So this site can offer like uh, faces, uh, sand and rock faces, and also cliffs. Uh, we've got there also screes or uh, water bodies and exposed bedrock of our substrate of different texture. And this geodiversity then becomes a driver of biodiversity, and this is uh, the goal of nature conservation. So, uh, also we should realize that these sites very often serve as soggy habitats for, man, uh, for many species, uh, including specialized species, or um, threatened or endangered and also those retreating from our highly eutrophicated landscape or highly modified. So I would like to mention also one point that uh, Europe uh, has been a largely human modified landscape and it has been subject of uh, rather intensive human impact for more than 8,000 years, so since the Neolithic time. And therefore, in Europe, we are almost depleted of pristine ecosystems. It's completely different to another continent. And instead, semi-natural habitats uh, developed here. And some of them are very valuable and even threatened. So while the nature conservation is mostly focused just on preserving uh, already mostly well uh, uh, preserved habitats, uh, we, uh, the others arising uh, in areas degraded by human activities, uh, such as quarries or mines, uh, remain overlooked or underestimated, uh, despite we can increase the, uh, and maximize the biodiversity potential. So that's the most important point. And uh, just one last <laughs> remark. Yes, yeah. um, we, if we uh, want to create sites that uh, in quarries and mines that will be of ecological potential, we must follow the simple rule that uh, nothing uh, what we are not able to restore shouldn't be destroyed. So we should avoid such places and we should be focused mostly on, uh, on areas and landscape where we can increase the biodiversity, as I mentioned, for example, the homogeneous landscape or degraded landscape. Here's the great potential. Thank you, Professor. Moving on to Mr. Verma, how can we increase the recycling of sandy and stone-rich waste uh, streams, such as construction demolition waste, and what is the key to expanding the use of recycled aggregates? And who is better uh, to tell us about this uh, than you, as we've seen on the presentation of Mr. Laduros, Belgium is the number one uh, in uh, um, a number of countries. So what, what are your tips? Great job to be here. Thank you. Uh, giving my thoughts on this interesting topic. What is very important when we're talking about uh, waste treatment is end of waste regulation. Uh, a good end of waste regulation is the basis of uh, everything. There's a guideline used in Europe, but we, but we see that not all member states implement it on the same way. In Belgium, we have real good end of waste regulation, and it's, it defines the fact when waste stops being waste and becomes a new resource. When you want to build new things with new resources or recycled aggregates, so I'm not talking about secondary mm. aggregates, but I think it's better to speak about recycled aggregates uh, because they could be of uh, the same quality as primary aggregates, then it's very important legally, uh, juridically, that the new uh, producer of, uh, let's say, concrete structure can do that with resources and not with waste. So that's already very important. Uh, secondly, the backbone of all the waste treatment is traceability. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot of investments uh, on company uh, size to do all those investments, but also 
uh, controlled by government and authorities. Uh, and also very important is uh, when you have uh, recycling treatment, you, you still need incineration and landfilling. So landfilling pol policy is very important. Uh, use the landfills, landfills for what they are built for. Just uh, in, it's an end disposal, uh, disposal of non-recyclable fractions. That's very important. So uh, make a list, and uh, that's how we do it in Belgium. There is a list of uh, waste that cannot be landfill because they are, by best practices, they are recyclable. Then there is another list of materials that are doubtful to being recyclable or not, and there is a team of experts on each fraction of waste that gives their interpretation, is it recyclable or not? And if you want to go to a landfill with recyclable material, on top of the gate fee of the landfill, you will have to pay an, an environmental tax that's applied by uh, authorities. Um, that makes also that recycling is cheaper than landfilling. It's, every, it's everything about the euros that we all have to pay. And it, that also gives that tax oxygen to the recycling industry to, to have more uh, thorough uh, recycling activities, also for complex waste. And that is also why we manage to get around 30% uh, that we can do in, uh, in replacement. The use of secondary or better uh, recycled aggregates uh, can also be improved by uh, uh, giving a structural demand on the use of those uh, recycled aggregates. Um, government there should lead by example in uh, public projects, for instance, that they said, okay, this project now, we want to open up the, the actual standards and norms, uh, uh, invest in new best practices, and let uh, recycled aggregates be part of the project. So we, we, you have to create a demand, and then the recycling industry will adapt uh, both on volumes and on technology to create also that volume needed in the market. Thank you very much. So it needs time, a bit of le legislation, yeah. organization, and succession. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very interesting. Mr. Laduros, we have all understood from your presentation that uh, how essential aggregates are to humanity. My question, given this, is what specific policies would you recommend for ensuring the sustainable supply of this essential product? Without nature, it's obvious there will be no life. Without aggregates, there will be life, but it's obvious it wouldn't be as comfortable as most of us on this planet enjoy today, and I show in the presentation what I mean. So as a matter of fact, we need both. And both are, es are essential. Nature and aggregates, of course, are essential. We have to find we have to find ways in order for these two to coexist. And we have to find ways for these to coexist not only for now but also for future generations. Because so many thousand years humanity is building with aggregates. Because before it was stone, now it's aggregates. And um, I don't think so we will find another way of building. Aggregates will be always the, the, the most consumed building material. And this is sustainability, to find ways in order to coexist with nature conservation, to coexist with environment, but to have this essential raw material for many years to come. And uh, as aggregates Europe UPG, we carried out a study around Europe. This is a study, sustainable supply of aggregates in Europe. It is on our, on our website, you can uh, download it. We asked the University of Leopen in Austria. They screened all Europe, and they came up with recommendations. So recommendation number one is access to local resources. It's not sustainable to have a quarry 100 or 200 kilometers from Paris, from Brussels, from Berlin, from Nicosia. We need access to local resources. As I said, our footprint, carbon footprint, is only 4.5 kilograms per ton. If you transport aggregates another 40 kilometers, you have another 4.5 kilograms. Then on, it is exponentially the footprint increases 
from transportation. So we need local access to resources. Quarries need to be near the demand. Second thing, this study shows that around Europe it's a big mess of what is going on regarding permitting procedures from five years to 15 or 20 years. How you can plan and open a quarry if you need 15 years or 20 years to, to get a permit. So what we want, recommendation number two, we want fast track streamlining permitting procedures. You know, the, the, the commissioner spoke about the Critical Raw Materials Act. The Critical Raw Materials Act is talking about fast track streamlining permitting procedure, but it's only for critical raw materials. There is the recital X6, sorry, recital 6. We are only communicating, we are already communication with the geology department and the mining and service, mining and quarry services in order to pass as an island, Cyprus, in recital 6 to have an extra list for aggregates because Cyprus is an island. So we have to use our own aggregates. So we need to introduce fast track permitting procedures for aggregates as well, not only for the critical raw materials. And another thing is we need straightforward regulations regarding that, that will facilitate, better say, the coexistence of, of extraction sites and environment. We need straightforward regulations for this. In order, those that as the commissioner said, we need to also show best practices. Those that cannot do it, to get out of the market. We need straightforward regulations that will guide everybody in order to coexist with nature uh, conservation. And fourth, recycling of course, circular economy. We need to use all our waste and substitute as much as we can the primary aggregates. We will always need primary aggregates. You saw the numbers in my presentation. We can reach maximum 20, 25%. So we will always need primary aggregates for the rest 75, 80%. Thank you. Very uh, interesting proposals. Indeed, 15 years is a very long time. Uh, but now we will uh, do a back-to-back -back, uh, two questions for Madam Commissioner because um, before we entered the room, uh, she had a last-minute call from the Presidential Palace about um, a business obligation. So after the two questions, we, uh, you can be released from this uh, room. <laughs> If, if there is any question after I leave, uh, I have uh, my scientific collaborator here and uh, she will she be can. able to answer. Okay, okay? and I'm sorry about this. No but I would like to comment something on the graphs uh, that Mr. Latouros has shown, the 4% of uh, using our waste, plus this should also be taken into consideration, the, the um, production or the use of aggregates in Cyprus is double than the average in uh, Europe. The consumption. The per consumption. Capita, per capita is double than yes. The so this is something very critical that we should always take into consideration if we talk about sustainability. Is it because of the sudden growth in the market? It is because of the any growth on the market in Cyprus. And this is why I mentioned at the beginning that the nature should set us the ceiling. There is always a ceiling. And historically, uh, also in, in during the antiquity, also in recent years, there is destruction of civilizations because they didn't adapt to the nature call. I hear you. So, <laughs> Madam Commissioner, uh, the first question for you before you leave is uh, what role do you see the government playing in promoting the recycling of construction and demolition waste and the use of recycled aggregates? Does the government provide support to businesses adopting these practices? And maybe this is a bit related to what you have just uh, commented uh, earlier. The government should take the lead for promoting the recycling of construction and demolition waste and the use of recycled uh, aggregates through a clear regulatory framework and strict targets. This responsibility is highlighted within the broader framework of the Critical Raw Materials Act, which has been mentioned, which places strong emphasis on the circularity of critical materials across the EU. However, implementing this act in different EU member states comes with several hurdles, 
Regulatory, regulatory frame fragmentation compli complicates cross-border projects, while strict environmental laws and local opposition can deter investment and cause delays. Some countries lack significant deposits of critical raw materials, making it hard to establish local supply chains. And infrastructure deficiencies further hinder efficient transport. Transport. Political instability and economic uncertainty also makes uh, attracting foreign investment difficult. Addressing these issues requires coordinated efforts to harmonize regulations, raise public awareness, and invest in infrastructure and technology that support sustainable growing practices. While fully aligning with the EU's ambitious goals of achieving at least 25% of its material needs through recycling by 2030 may be challenging, Cyprus can progressively increase its recycling rates, focusing on feasible, localized solutions that reduce dependence on raw resources and promote the circular use of materials. By mandating the use of recycled materials and promoting the reuse of existing buildings in public infrastructure projects, as well as providing financial incentives for businesses investing in recycling technologies, such as tax exemptions or subsidies, significant progress can be made in improving material sustainability. Moreover, the government should support research and development to improve the quality of recycled aggregates, making them a competitive alternative to raw materials. materials. Public outreach is equally important. Both the construction industry, training and capacity building for the necessary skills and the public must be educated on the environmental and economic benefits of reusing materials which can, can significantly reduce waste and environmental degradation. To further accelerate this shift, the government should implement green public procurement standards that prioritize recycled aggregates and traditional materials like adobe and stone in public projects. By leading through, by leading through example, the government can drive market demand for sustainable materials and reshape the industry toward a more sustainable circular economy. Thank you. And the second and last question for you, uh, Commissioner Theodosio. What do you envision for the future of the aggregates industry in Cyprus, considering that Cyprus, as uh, previously mentioned by Mr. Laduros, is an isolated island where importing aggregates is almost impossible? And how can the industry remain essential while prioritizing sustainability? The future of the aggregates industry in Cyprus, with its unique status as an island with limited resources, as you mentioned, holds immense potential. However, we must be courageous enough to embrace a new path, one that respects the finite nature of our island's resources while safeguarding the environment and ensuring responsible use of our natural resources. To achieve this, it is critical that we focus on sustainability by making the reuse of materials and other alternative materials, as I mentioned before, and the integration of circular economy principles a mandate for the industry's future. The use of recycled aggregates from construction and demolition waste must become the foundation of this transformation Reuse of materials in line with established quality standards incorporated into building plans ensures that sustainability does not compromise safety of performance. These standards could require a minimum of 4% and a maximum of 25 recycled materials in construction projects, effect in, a, in, in singular construction projects effectively utilizing recycled aggregates while maintaining structural integrity. In Germany, where I studied, we do have examples of 100% of using uh, materials from waste. This approach not only reduces the environmental footprint of new developments, but also addresses the wasteful practices that have long plagued our industry. Every disused quarry is an opportunity waiting to be seized an opportunity to restore ecosystems and biodiversity. It does not happen on its own. Transforming these areas into natural sanctuaries 
In doing so, we can ensure that the aggregate industry continues to contribute to the economy without compromising environmental health. Cyprus should also explore partnerships with other Mediterranean and other countries to share knowledge and technologies that support sustainable aggregate production. This regional approach could help address the specific challenges of island economies, such as resource scarcity and environmental sensitivity. And concluding, if we are to leave behind a legacy that honors both economic progress and environmental stewardship, we should start by redesigning the system to prioritize sustainability at every level. This is not simply a choice, it is a necessity. Let this be our pledge that the aggregate industry will thrive in harmony with nature and society, not at its expense, creating a resilient and prosperous future for Cyprus. Thank you very much. I understand you will need to leave. Are there any closing remarks? Because we're going to take our time later on. Uh, would you like to add anything else, Madam Commissioner? I've done my closing remarks. I leave the time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. It was great, an honor having you uh, in this panel. Uh, do you have, um, does, please. Mr. Kekhtriotis, could you please repeat the question so we can hear it? The question, don't you think that the use of aggregates is also uh, uh, directly uh, um, uh, in relation with population and then political uh, uh, decisions uh, to join Europe and uh, invite uh, the increase of population as we did in, uh, in Cyprus? Uh, surely, uh, the use of aggregates comes in a larger uh, need, uh, and also infrastructure. As we see, is uh, we lack uh, infrastructure. So, yes, we do need to protect uh, the per capita use, uh, but uh, we also need to accommodate this increase of population in uh, cities and in general. Yes, of course. If we talk about Cyprus, uh, there, were, there are periods of our history that where we needed more aggregates, okay? And this, is, uh, this happened after the Turkish invasion, that we needed uh, to develop uh, in a in an area which was not so far developed before. And this is, uh, this is a critical situation where we should adapt uh, with the aggregate's primary uh, production. But if we talk about today, it's the ratio of our building development that sets the targets and the needs of the aggregates and also the bad uh, developments we have in areas where we have erosion. And this also creates needs for aggregates, so we should be proactive and be sustainable with our development and development goals, and then check on the needs of primary uh, aggregates. I don't know if I have if, if I have answered your question. Uh, you did in a way, uh, but uh, Cyprus uh, at uh, uh, mid 70s uh, were counting nearly uh, 700,000 uh, people. Uh, now if we count the population living in uh, Cyprus, we are over 3 million. And what we hear on the other side, uh, that still is Cyprus, uh, the population there is growing even in a greater rate than we do uh, in the uh, um, uh, south. And uh, the use of aggregates there is turning into a, a huge environmental uh, aspect for our and, main... And, uh, and to clarify project. to our audiences, the population has increased not because of the locals, but because of the foreign, foreign invest, uh, investments that are happening uh, in the island. So we attract a lot of foreigners uh, moving uh, to Cyprus for a safer environment, but also for business purposes. And in the north, because of the massive settlement from Turkey. Definitely, yes. So, um, 
this is why I referred before, maybe it was not so understandable, about the new European Bauhaus, uh, which prioritized the reuse of our buildings. Uh, and it's not only a phenomenon in Cyprus, but especially in Cyprus, uh, we, have, we do have this phenomenon of, of empty traditional buildings or of empty buildings that were built maybe 20 years ago. And they are not re renovated. They are empty and they need to be inhabited before proceeding in building new. Secondly, um, in Cyprus, we do have all these methods, and it's not only in Cyprus, I know it happens in Luxembourg, in Malta, and in many other countries, we do build and sell homes which stay empty, because uh, it's an investment. And also, they receive passports, uh, citizenship, okay? I, I remember being in Malta some years ago, and we traveled through many regions where there were like uh, ghost uh, towns. And they are empty, they are not used. So the new European Bauhaus, which is a, a European initiative and is part of the European Green Deal, prioritizes the reuse or, of our existing uh, building uh, reserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us tonight, today. Of course. So, Dr. Mesimeris, we're coming back to you. Uh, let's uh, go back to, uh, for a while to construction and demolition waste. What are the main challenges that your department faces in dealing uh, with illegal dumping of construction and demolition waste? And what incentives are in place to increase the use of recycled aggregates? Many thanks. Before going to, to the challenges, I want, I want to uh, send a clear message to everybody. Illegal dumping is a crime. So uh, we have to tra transpose this message to everybody because uh, one uh, action that uh, we are planning is to better enforce the, le the le uh, legislation. We have already had a, a number of meetings with the police and we do have a, cap a campaign to address this crime. Okay, so it's one of our top priority because without this, uh, we cannot talk about any other incentives or uh, let's say options. So regarding the challenges, of course, we do have the environmental challenges, uh, the environmental impacts on, uh, on uh, the ground, on, on the atmosphere, on, on the biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, we do have challenges uh, regarding the social issues, the lowers of the property values, uh, the uh, other uh, challenges uh, regarding the uh, unfair competition, because uh, when we're talking about the legal dumping, it's obvious that uh, somebody is having uh, uh, an advantage regarding the, the management or the appropriate management of, of this kind of waste. So, um, of course, uh, we have to uh, structure uh, our, uh, the appropriate plan to, to address uh, the relevant challenges, and for this reason, uh, my minister already announced a framework of actions in order to, to address all, all these issues regarding and related with the illegal dumping. One uh, action is to clean up the already affected areas. We do have a campaign now that is running, and with uh, the cooperation with the Local authorities, uh, we will try to clean up all the the illegal uh, dumping sites. Of course, uh, we have to find uh, all the appropriate elements, not to not to uh, let's say repeat uh, the, the 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 illegal dumping and. Uh, try to minimize all, all, all these activities, illegal activities. So uh, we do not have incentives, we do have obligations. And of course, within uh, the waste management strategy, uh, we do have also some elements that will uh, give uh, 
different direction uh, comparing to, to the uh, illegal dumping. And I mean that uh, we will uh, give uh, the appropriate waste pricing approach in order to be uh, able for having the cheapest way the recycling, right? Uh, uh, as already mentioned. So we will try to introduce the appropriate, apart from the obligation, the appropriate pricing on waste management and try to, let's say, redesign the whole approach for uh, the uh, management of uh, construction and demolition waste. Of course, we do have obligation on the producers. Of course, we do have obligations under the polluted space principle. The missing point, and this is what we are working on it, is to implement and then force the relevant legal framework. And this is what we are trying to, to have as a priority uh, regarding our activities as the Department of Environment. Thank you. We look forward uh, to, to this. But coming back to the best example of Europe, Mr. Vermont, how do you manage to control the illegal dumping of uh, construction demolition waste in Belgium? Maybe we can get some tips from you and uh, implement them to the local market. Yes, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that my neighbor already filled in partially my answer. Uh, but yes, it's, it's a crime. Uh, in Belgium, it's also a crime. Um, and the chance to get caught in Belgium is very much higher than here because here is much more open space. It's the first time that I'm in Cyprus, but it's a big difference. Uh, Belgium is heavily crowded. Um, so if you, you or you get caught by someone who just passes there or a camera in the neighborhood or from traffic uh, traced you and you're being uh, caught, uh, you have to appear before court, you get sentenced, convicted, and it's on your criminal record with all the uh, negative uh, uh, issues about that. Um, a suggestion, uh, also my intro on the first uh, uh, response was traceability. Um, what we do, uh, we have pre-demolition audits. When a building is being demolished, or is being planned to be demolished, an external expert has to investigate the building that has to be demolished, and he makes difference between high risk and low risk materials in the building. So there's an uh, external report in, the, in identifying those materials, and then you will have to do by selective demolition, the isolation and evacuation of all those materials. Um, at the end of the demolition works, you have to give proof by attestation of the treatment centers who, for instance, one got the asbestos materials, high risk, other ones got just stones uh, for uh, crushing, and you have to combine those uh, attestations from the treatment facilities in order to get a demolition uh, final report. Uh, it, that all has to do with uh, some fiscal or tax uh, advantages in order to also promote the people to do the exercise. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. We are a bit tight in time. Um, so if we can uh, make our uh, rest of the answers a bit shorter, um, coming back to you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Laduros, considering the wider public perception that quarries are not environmentally friendly, have you succeeded in fostering this collaboration with the big international environmental NGOs, as uh, we've seen in the presentation earlier? Yes, indeed, for us it's a big challenge. The wrong perception of the community in general that uh, we are not environmental friendly. So how else to, to solve this problem? Collaboration, transparency. So we started more than 10 years now, contacting these big NGOs. For, I will give you a few examples. For example, IUCN. Back in 2012, with IUCN, we, we signed a letter of intent. And now we are, we are in the process of updating the letter of intent. And we are going to sign it in the near future. We are going to organize an event in Brussels in order tonight to sign the updated one. Again, IUCN, we were invited at the IUCN World Congress back in September 2021. 
It is the largest uh, world congress, environmental congress taking place on this planet every four years. And uh, we were invited there by WWF and by UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program. And we were, in, we were asked to deliver a presentation with the title Sun Scarcity and Infrastructure and Nature Coalition. And we went there and it was like going to Dragos Den. Why? Because these people, they want to make sure that we do our job responsibly and sustainably. And as I told them then, I'm repeating it now. Yes, we do. And after we finish our presentation, officials of these two big organizations, they got up after me, they took the stage, and they said very clearly, the European aggregates industry is not a threat for the environment, they said. On the contrary, it's part of the solution and a very good example to be followed worldwide. It's not us saying this. The respect is mutual on both sides. Another good example is in October 2021, under the auspices of the European Commission, DG Environment, in, in Brussels, together with other two European associations, Eurogypsum, the, the European Association for Gypsum, and Semperu, the European Association for Cement, uh, together with BirdLife Europe, we signed the, the, the Species Protection Code of Contact, which is a very, very good tool which describes how both can coexist, extractive industry and conservation of environment. And at my speech at that event, I said, for us, the European aggregates industry, this code of contact is a code of honor. Because, okay, we provide humanity with, us, with an essential product, but we also care for those that have no voice to protest, flora and fauna. Another good example is when the nature restoration plan was in process, the nature restoration law was in process, Together with PetLife Europe, again with Eurogypsum Semberu, we issued position papers together with PetLife Europe, I repeat. We sent letters to the president of the commission, to the commissioner of environment, asking them to, to be faster, not to postpone the processes, asking them to because we wanted this nature restoration law. And very recently, last week, we had in our uh, office in Brussels, it was last Wednesday, 25th of September, every year we do this, late summer reception, and the, the subject covered at this late summer reception was uh, nature restoration law. And there we had uh, the director of DG Environment, director of biodiversity, keynote speeches, we had uh, the director of IUCN Europe, we had a high official from BetLife Europe. We have MEPs, and all these they gave keynote speeches. And we have also people from, our, from the industry, experts about biodiversity. And uh, at my closing remarks, I said, if you were telling someone before 10, 15 years that the extractive industry, together with NGOs, together with the DG environment, will sit in the same room promoting nature restoration law, they will tell you you are crazy. No way but it happened. Thank you. Thank you. Leading us then to the next question for Professor Zekonkova. Uh, is it possible to create diverse habitats and promote biodiversity during coring, or is it necessary to wait until after it has ceased? And there's a second part to this question. Are there specific examples where rare habitats have been uh, restored in uh, the quarries, or endangered species have found a new home in mining sites? Uh, yes, uh, I've already mentioned that species can colonize the extraction sites from the nearby habitat, so it's absolutely clear that these sites can serve as temporal or even permanent habitats for these organisms. And uh, the active quarry can contribute to uh, biodiversity conservation based on implementation of uh, dynamic management uh, already during the excavation process and not as a part of a restoration at the end uh, once the site is, um, uh, when the implementation is finished. So it means just uh, create a network of temporary habitats and uh, manage dynamically through time and space uh, them all around the quarry 
so uh, these activities are parallel in the active process of excavation uh, to ensure uh, to ensure uh, keeping the uh, permanent uh, availability of these habitats, such as let's say fixed number of pools uh, during the life of quarries. And uh, we should also realize that uh, these extraction sites can serve uh, literally as uh, uh, stepping stones uh, for species, uh, allowing them uh, movement between the habitats through the landscape. And this is very important in fragmented uh, or urbanized landscape. Uh, just uh, let me to give you an example. Uh, this, uh, because this, uh, just, uh, just one example, uh, and uh, the Natterjack toad is a rare and threatened frog, uh, quite rare in many European countries. And uh, it uh, lives in uh, car ruts or shallow flooded sites. Uh, but such ephemeral biodiversity in and around uh, the quarries uh, is not possible to manage through legal conservation or preservation status uh, of the site, but it's rather easily achieved by optimizing the groundworks uh, in the quarries or the mines uh, through the mining or quarrying activity and this enables uh, these species to survive and use this unique habitats, or just temporal habitats. And nowadays, uh, many of these amphibians uh, are found in quarries. The highest population are just here. So this is just one example. And we've got also another great example, uh, the uh, St. Martins, uh, rather cute uh, or very cute birds uh, related to swallows. And uh, these birds uh, have lost most of their habitats over the last years. They used to live in uh, uh, sandy walls along the rivers, uh, but uh, because of channelization of the rivers, they lost their uh, native sites. Uh, fortunately, these birds are very adaptive and they found new home. <laughs> they moved to St. Faces in active uh, quarries. Uh, it sounds like a happy ending, <laughs> but <laughs> if these birds uh, colonize, because uh, they live in uh, deep burrows in these faces, and if these birds colonize uh, the quarries, all the work must be stopped from, let's say, March or April to June, uh, because these birds are protected, <laughs> of course. But there's a simple measure. Uh, just before arriving, these birds, uh, it's just the particular phase is set aside, uh, the different one than the previous years and the rest are reprofiled to make them less attractive for these birds. And these simple steps uh, just help to or enable coexistence of these rare birds uh, with the active uh, quarrying or mining activities. So that's a great example. And uh, I would like also mention uh, that uh, some, which is not very often considered, uh, that some specific bedrock uh, like uh, serpentine or gypsum or some metalliferous outcrops um, are very unique from the biological point of view and are quite attractive for some kind of biota. So uh, if, this, uh, if such bedrock is available once the mining is uh, ceased and not covered by organic layer or depleted completely, uh, here may constitute very unique uh, plant communities and associated fauna, very often insect and this kind of organism. So this is also important. And um, also uh, in some regions, some very common mineral resources like sand uh, might be of great importance for nature conservation because the landscape dramatically changed in some regions and we are losing uh, the 
diverse mosaic of uh, different habitats, including these open sandy areas. And these sandy grasslands are um, classified as a priority habitat in Habitat Directive. So if uh, these sites are available uh, during the process or even after the extraction process, the many rare species can find new habitats just here, new home. And uh, the typical example uh, can be wild bees and, bo and wasps. Uh, they are important pollinators and help uh, us to maintain biodiversity and ecosystem healthy. And uh, yeah, that's why some of the uh, post-extraction sites uh, are recently managed as uh, nature reserves. And some of them are also included into the Natura 2000 sites. But these positive outcomes are uh, not just depending on the specific site environment and time, mm -hmm. but to a large uh, extent also on supportive legislation. This is also an important point. And also on well-executed mining processes and uh, well-designed restoration solution. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's funny that you mentioned about the um, endangered species and specifically birds because we have a similar situation in Cyprus as well. Uh, towards the west uh, Cyprus, uh, southwest Cyprus, uh, with uh, endangered bats, if I remember correctly. And uh, it is a fact that, uh, as we previously mentioned in the panel discussion as well, that traveling long distances, like 60 kilometers or more, uh, can generate significant uh, carbon emission from ve vehicles used to carry aggregates, often exceeding the emissions produced during the actual, actual extraction and processing of the aggregates at uh, the quarry. Thus, it seems uh, we have to deal with an even greater carbon footprint. And that brings me to a question uh, to you, Dr. Mesmeris. How does the Environment uh, Department plan to address the aggregate supply challenges in Bafos and Xilofago quarry zones, given the depletion of deposits and expansion constraints? And also, what strategies are being considered to balance the local production with sustainability goals, particularly regarding the potential of CO2 emissions from transporting aggregates from other districts? Yeah, uh, it's true that we face uh, supply challenges in Cyprus, and this is something that uh, we're trying to find the appropriate approach. And uh, for this, uh, we were working with all stakeholders in an integrated way. Of course, we do have uh, to consider the CO2 emissions, but also we have to consider all environmental parameters. And for this reason, we, we have a holistic approach and try to find with all limitations that we have the appropriate approach. It's, it's not an easy task, but uh, we have to do it because uh, uh, we do have, of course, the other limitations from the legal framework, the nature directive, the, the habitat directive and all this. So uh, we will try to do our best, but of course at the same time we do have space for more recycling. We have very, very low rates on recycling materials, so we have to focus also our effort to try to find uh, additional, uh, let's say, elements to introduce more recycling regarding the, the aggregates. Definitely, but as far as I can understand, in Bafos and Xilofau, there is a lack of quarries. It's, they do not exist. So sometimes we can balance things out when it comes to the environment and use the, the option of, uh, uh, of the demolition waste when uh, quarries are, all, are also available and the distances are quite uh, long. I am not the person that uh, will, can talk about this, of course, but um, I can understand the challenges and I'm gonna leave uh, these uh, comments later on to the professionals. But because we don't have enough time, I'm gonna jump to our last question that has to do with our with the law enforcement. Uh, enforcement. And uh, I'm gonna ask it to Mr. Laduros. The uh, nature restoration law was recently implemented across Europe. Do you see this as a threat or an opportunity for the European aggregates industry? 
Yeah, indeed, the nature restoration law, better say European Union by implementing this nature restoration law has set very ambitious targets, I can say. Targets which are uh, crucial for the sustainability of our environment and for the well-being of future generations. This is the target of this law. Uh, our industry, in general, the extractive industry, but particularly aggregate sector, we play a very, a very vital and very unique role in this mission, I can say. Okay, our industry, we don't only, it doesn't only provide this essential product which supports us, we all understand, the whole construction, the whole infrastructure around us, but we also, our industry also possesses expertise and resources needed for an effective land restoration. So because of this, we believe that nature restoration law for us is a great opportunity. That's why together with Perth Life Europe, we issued position papers, we sent letters, we had our late summer reception last week, and it is an opportunity, why? Because this is what we are doing. Land restoration, nature restoration is already part of our business model. We know it. And because we know what we are doing, we want all the member states, the authorities, and here is the authority for Cyprus, when they are going to develop these na nature restoration plans, to do it in collaboration with us. For two main reasons. Because we know how to do it. And secondly, let's preserve the potential resources for the future. Definitely. Collaboration always brings the best results in the market. Uh, now, as we wrap up our discussion, I'd like to invite uh, two of the panelists that I skipped the, their question. If they have any closing remarks, uh, please summarize your thoughts or share any final insights, um, uh, if you may. It's up to you, Mr. Vermont and uh, Professor. I will be short. Um, I see the future bright for uh, recycled aggregates because there's political awareness. Otherwise, we weren't here today to do that. Um, but we have to be realistic and pragmatic. Also, like Mr. Laturo said, we, we build more, so the demand, demand for aggregates is higher than that we demolish. Um, and what is very important for me to conclude in the use of recycled aggregates is you have to define the quality of the aggregates uh, independent of the origin or its primary or recycled for the intended use. And then you'll see that a uh, recycling activity will appear and will technologically adapt to deliver the quality needed for the intended use. So you have to, to make the connection between quality of the aggregates and the intended, intended use. So. Thank you. Uh, Professor Zehonkova, could you please give us your closing remark if you have any? Uh, I would like to highlight the importance of nature restoration law, as has been already said here. It offers uh, opportunity to uh, make uh, the nature uh, uh, in making um, uh, conservation processes more efficient in uh, disturbed sites, so also in the quarries. Uh, we definitely need the clear guidelines how to do it uh, with uh, real clear recommendations for stakeholders where, what, and how to measure or to manage these sites and what to do exactly. And so let's do it. But first, we need really broad discussion uh, and invited the representatives from different spheres, not just the academics, but also practitioners and policymakers, and of course, the representative of the business sphere. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insightful uh, closing uh, remarks. Now I'd like to open the floor for a short Q&A session. If anyone from the audience uh, has questions, please free, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll call you to share your question. And please wait for the microphone so our live streaming will hear you. Any questions from the audiences? I think we pretty much covered everything. No questions. Maybe our uh, panelists will. Uh, do you have any other closing remarks or any uh, any question to another fellow panelist? Just uh, to conclude.
Not, uh, uh, we do have uh, the, the policy framework, we do have uh, the, the legal framework, we do have the implementing uh, means. Uh, so uh, it's time um, to act. Uh, everybody has a role and uh, we have to focus to do our best in order to find the appropriate way how to handle aggregates, how to introduce new approaches in order to minimize environmental impacts and try to be on a sustainable uh, way. Thank you, Dr. Mesimeris. President always have a word to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will just repeat a few things just to remind emphasize. everybody to emphasize, yes. <laughs> that, uh, yes, we need both nature and aggregates. Otherwise, there will be life. There wouldn't be well-being. So we need both. We have to find ways to coexist. There are ways to coexist, and we have experts to, to show us how to do it. And uh, we need the perception to change the perception of the community. That's uh, why on Aggregates Europe UPNG, in our budget, we have a very big number in our budget, and we call it investment in communication. We need to communicate more and more the essentiality of our industry, because as I said, if there were no aggregates, there would be literally nothing around us. That's it. Well Thank understood. You. We made that clear throughout the panel discussion, and of course, uh, with all the knowledge that uh, we have gained uh, through um, this uh, session, I'm sure we will all leave this room with uh, a better insight and uh, uh, be a, a bit more aware. Thank you all for your. You have a question. A final, uh, just of course, let's just wait for the microphone. Just not to forget the two areas in Cyprus that uh, at the moment they are lacking uh, aggregates. It's an essential uh, matter that you have to address it uh, urgently. And I believe that uh, you have to address it in a way that they will feel that they will stay at those places and uh, enforce all these environmental uh, uh, issues uh, and not be again uh, a license for three years and five years so they feel that we, can don't, uh, we cannot do something serious in this, uh, in this time. Thank you. And we also have to act when there is a need because after we... The need is now. Exactly. Be proactive. Exactly. Dr. It's very important what uh, Costas just said because now we have the problem in Bafos and Xilofago. Actually, the deposits are running out. In Bafos, maybe we have, and we don't have one year more, two years maximum. In Xilofago, the situation is much worse. And if we don't do something yesterday in order to expand these core zones, it means we are going to load our atmosphere with thousand tons of CO2 because we will need to transport aggregates from Limassol and Nicosia to these two districts. But then, very soon, we will face problems in Limassol and Nicosia. Definitely. Instead of saying uh, that uh, we have deposits for Limassol and Nicosia for the next, I don't know, 25, 30 years, if we are going to supply Paphos and uh, Famacusta, the free Famacusta district, from these two districts then, the 30 years will be much, much less. And we will face the same problem in the near future in the other districts as well. Certainly. Well, it is clear that the aggregates industry plays a crucial role. Uh, please, yes. All of a sudden, everyone feels more comfortable now. <laughs> Your um, name. Thank you. No, my uh, my question has to do with the last comment. Yes. Um, since uh, we're talking about uh, transportation and distances between the ports and the the need, um, and Cyprus is pretty small state. So my question goes to our guests from abroad. Um, I would like to ask whether there are any data regarding the average distance in Europe or in your countries, the Czech Republic and Belgium, regarding the quarries and the demanding sites. 
So what's the average? Because we're talking about 40 kilometers and 50 kilometers. I can answer this from aggregates Europe, European Union. We have the data from all the European countries. So the, the maximum distance that aggregates are transported by trucks, because in Europe they have also the railways, they have rivers as well, but by trucks the maximum is 40, 50 kilometers, yeah. Okay. This is the maximum. Yes. As I said in my presentation, it's not sustainable to have quarries 100 kilometers from Paris, from Berlin, from Brussels, from Nicosia, yes. The Thank same. you. <laughs> This is a very good point we didn't mention. It. Thank yes. Costas for bringing it up. We, we, we need to understand that aggregates, we, uh, sorry, quarries will operate where nature has put the good quality rock. We cannot have quarries wherever we want. We need to have them where it's a good quality rock. It's so, where the nature offers the yeah, quarries. So, it's not and something wherever that can we be go, created by a man. Wherever we go to open a quarry is nature, it's environment. Exactly. Everywhere. So we need to find ways to coexist. And there are ways. I think we you, need to accept them. I think <laughs> everyone in this room should have another meeting later on in private and discuss the solutions and ideas that you might have. Uh, so just a closing remark is that the collaboration between industry, government and academia is vital for addressing the challenges we face, as you have all understood and pointed out uh, earlier. I want to extend my gratitude uh, to our esteemed panelists uh, for their expertise and to the audience uh, for your thoughtful questions and engagement, of course, towards the end. <laughs> I hope you leave today with a bit deeper understanding on how we can all contribute to a more more sustainable aggregates industry. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the Cyprus Forum 2024.